and into Sydney Harbour steam heavy units of the British Pacific Fleet, led by the 35,000-ton battleship King George V. This mad idea of us going round the Pacific, uh, the Americans didn't want us, but Churchill, in his wisdom, contacted Roosevelt and said, can we go round the Pacific and give you a hand? And Roosevelt apparently contacted the Royal Commander of the American fleet. And he said, well, we don't want you. We'll only be in the way, sort of thing. I can see his point, our little fleet, although it was big on to British styles, compared with the American fleet, it was nothing, nothing at all. They didn't want us. Anyway, Churchill sort of insisted, Roosevelt pushed again and then got on to Chester Nimitz. So he was a big, big noise up there, Chester Nimitz, who said, yeah, all right, we'll have them, but they wouldn't support us. When um, some elements in the American Navy, and particularly like the naval chief, uh, didn't want us there at all. And in fact, the Americans didn't want us in the Pacific at the end of the war. They felt, you know, we've got 40 aircraft carriers, we can cope with this lot on our own, and indeed they could have done. But it was politically important for us to be seen out there, you know, for the people in Singapore to see a British ship, for the people in Hong Kong to realise the Brits were back, uh, for the people in Malaysia to suddenly realise that their British oppressors and colonists were back in charge again. Um, it was important um, from that aspect that there was a visible naval presence out there at the end of the war to restore the role of the white man as opposed to the Japanese who had colonized everything out there. When we haven't mentioned er Ernie J. King's objections, chief of uh, the American Navy, in no kind, I don't want any goddamn limeys around that. There'll always be a drag on the, the thing. Well, I didn't blame him from that point of view. The joke was, that when we did get there, I've never seen Americans more eager to give you everything. <laughs> they say, any guy goes up the sharp head, he says, he can have everything. <laughs> so then how? Rather you than me, buddy. <laughs> so that was great. But of course, that didn't go down with King very well. We just joined the Americans, and some of them were for us, others were against us. I mean, Admiral King didn't like the British. Um, and um, I think they were testing us out. But then we proved ourselves. So then when they went up to Okinawa and uh, Japan, then they brought us with us. So we were part of the uh, whole setup. Admiral Nimitz, American Commander in Chief welcomes King George V, which heads a British task force operating with the Americans. Admiral Nimitz, addressing the ship's company, kills one particularly dirty rumour. Before the Pacific fleet was brought into action, you may remember that there were newspaper stories, below deck speculation, argument, that the Americans did not want the British fleet to come into the Pacific, but we wanted to carry this war on as a private war. As a person of some responsibility in the Pacific, I assure you that those statements were without foundation. From the very beginning, we welcomed your coming and we welcomed your help and we continue Welcome your help. So we were then part of the main American attacking force. 
they had about 40 aircraft carriers north of us and we had our four um, but we were part of their fleet it was part of the fifth fleet or the third fleet it depended who was commanding it if it was Admiral Halsey it was the fifth fleet if it was Admiral Spruance it was the third fleet and so we became Task Force 57 or Task Force 37 and that was our appellation and that's how we operated and we operated there until uh, the war finished Fatigues go on. but uh, I mean we knew that it was wanted we knew that we were doing the job that we could do well and we were you know what well, above all we knew that we were showing the Americans that we we could operate a, a carrier fleet and we had Americans on board so we really had some observers there who could see one of the things that really, I think, astonished the Americans was the high morale amongst the air crews. We had officers from each Navy serving in the middle of each Admiral's staff. Uh, we had uh, Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Halsey's representatives and formidable, charming people who were in touch with us and reporting to their own Admirals what we were doing and how we were doing it and advising us on the best ways of tackling particularly difficult targets, etc. 100% cooperation in every, every, every way. The one disappointment we had, of course, was the fact that their carriers were very fast ships. They would be two and three knots faster than the fastest we had. Our fleet carriers were usually about 30, 30 and a half knots. They could use flank speed up to 33 and 34 knots with the greatest of ease uh, which meant that when we offered them our light fleet carriers the Colossus class ships that only had 26 knot speed they were not readily acceptable to the Americans in fact weren't used operationally in the front line by them they only took our largest fastest fleet carriers uh, into their fleet in March we went off up into the Pacific as the British Pacific Fleet and took part in the iceberg series of operations which were as far as we were concerned this consisted of operations over a group of islands to the southwest of Okinawa Okinawa was one of the islands that the Americans were attempting to take it well they did eventually take it and our task was to neutralize the islands to the southwest and in North Formosa to prevent them being used uh, for reinforcement of aircraft and using as, as staging posts for aircraft so we were our task involved going in keeping the runways cratered which the, was the job the Avengers did and the fighter aircraft would go in and try and destroy any aircraft that happened to have arrived on the airfields during the time that uh, this task we shared with one of the American fleets and in fact there was activity over these islands virtually every day either from our fleet or from the Americans Well, um, they weren't very kind to us to begin with because they didn't particularly want us there. There was a rather snooty chap called Admiral King who didn't want the British there um, because they thought they were much superior and they thought that we were just war-weary and rather in, 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 in inferior in every way. But they soon also their tune because came the arrival of the kamikazes who came bundling down on our decks and on their decks owing to the fact that all the British carriers were built with three inches of armour plating on the deck as opposed to all the huge great um, American aircraft which were built with wooden decks so when the kamikazes landed on the decks there nose dived into them they went straight through the wooden decks into the hangars set everything ablaze there was a huge explosion
At the same time, they were landing on our deck, but none of them ever went through our decks. So they never got through into the carrier, which is the real damage they were trying to do. <laughs> I don't know, I mustn't go on like this, but the first time we were hit by a kamikaze, uh, of course the Americans were interested, the American Admiral fellows were interested to see what happened, and we were in Sydney, and I can remember the captain uh, taking, taking these fellows down the flight deck, and he said, well, this is where the thing hit us, and it was sort of an 18-inch gouge taken out of the flight deck, and they all thought they'd be being mucked about with, because an American carrier, they have gone straight through the deck into the ship and it been an awful thing they thought they were being mucked about with. We did actually have one nasty one where a kamikaze got in behind a gun turret and that killed 28 people. But on the whole, the kamikazes couldn't do the damage that they do the American things. So we were always put next to Japan, hoping that the, uh, they'd attack us and not the Americans. Well, the main fleet was enormously big. Um, it was, must have been quite the biggest fleet that uh, the Royal Navy had ever put to sea. Um, there were two battleships, King George V and the Howe, and there were four fleet carriers, which was um, victorious, formidable, um, indomitable, and indefatigable. Um, there was a cruiser squadron and four destroyer flotillas, so that's a lot of ships in there. And the fleet train then comprised of um, two escort carriers and um, all the merchantmen involved, tankers included, plus uh, three or four sloops and one destroyer. And so that was uh, the fleet train. So when you put the whole lot together, it was, uh, there were literally uh, more than a hundred ships, really. And we make an impressive sight going into Leyte Gulf. And we, <laughs> we're going in line ahead formation. And we must have thought we were quite impressive. But unfortunately, when we got to late, it might have been Ulithi, I'm not too sure. Anyway, the American fleet starts to come out. And it's never ending. This is the American third fleet. And it's just carrier after carrier and battleship after battleship. And we're just sitting out there. <laughs> mulling around sort of thing, waiting for them to come out before we go in. And, and I must admit, we, we saw the American fleets and things go out for this attack, and they started at absolute dawn, a hundred yards behind one another, and they were still going when it went dark. Hundreds and hundreds of them. And I mean, carriers, something like 10 carriers or something there. And all those follow up carriers, when they had an accident on a ship, they just threw it over the side. Another one came and landed on. Our fellows were taking the bits off and <laughs> trying to put them together. <laughs> it really was. Uh, it was their war, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it, 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 it sheer, sheer force of numbers did it. And uh, I think the Japanese knew they didn't stand an earthly once the Americans got going. They never knew, and practically no one there, and none of the Americans knew that the British played any force, part in the Pacific War. And uh, some years ago, I was in the States, and I was on one of their big freeways, and occasionally they have free coffee stops. <laughs> 
which are run by veterans, and uh, we pulled into one, and I went up, and the chap behind me was a veteran, and he got Okinawa written on the side of his cap, you see. I said, does that mean you were in the Okinawa campaign? And he said, sure it does. And I said, well, shake, fella, because I was there too. <laughs> Who the hell are you? <laughs> he didn't know. He, understandable.